the rapid development of internet technologies has posed great threats to our data like never before. A lack of privacy, cybersecurity, and decentralization has become a clear and immediate danger to our society worldwide. This is why we're going to talk about VPN, decentralized VPNs, and Tor today. What are they? What purpose do they serve? And how are they different from each other? This video, I will focus on the high level overview of these technologies. I will try to provide non-technical explanations to these services. Hi, I'm Modo Tech. Welcome to the channel where we discuss popular technology products, services, and projects. Please subscribe and like our videos. For each like we receive, $1 will be donated to UNICEF to help out millions of children around the world. Feel free to check out our July donation under our community tab. Imagine you're a college student living in the US and you are 20 years old, not old enough to buy a case of beer. So every Friday night, you give some cash to your friend Bob, who lives next door to buy beer for you from the grocery store. You're happy because you got your beer. After a while, Bob knows what beer you like, how much you can drink, and knows you're underage drinking. Bob now has become your single point of failure. If Bob decides to leak this information, or the police come to Bob to seek more answers, you're done. Bob is your traditional VPN. Many of them claim that they don't keep logs, but you don't really know. It's so difficult to prove. Sometimes they have horrible security too. They may think they're not keeping logs, but somebody else may be keeping logs for them. So what about decentralized VPN? Most of them are built on top of blockchain, such as the Deeper Network, Mysterium, Sentinel, Orchid, and there's some other ones. Will we fix our problem with Bob? Sure you will. Well, sort of. So let's say after Bob betrayed you, you decide to no longer stick with the same person to help you buy beer. Instead, you look for multiple strangers from the street. But why would anyone want to help you for free? Why? So you decide to pay each one of them some incentives for being part of your beer purchase operation. You tell the first person to give message to the next person, then the next person passes it down to the third person. Once the third person gets the beer, this person will pass everything back to the second person, first person, then you. Next Friday, you look for two to three new strangers and repeat the same thing. This way, it will be much harder to find all these strangers to put everything together. However, what they can do is they can have somebody sitting at the store and somebody else sitting right outside of your house. Some sort of time and cash correlations can be established. It is still kind of difficult these days, but it's possible if you have enough resources and authorities. They will find out you're underage drinking. This is just a watered down analogy of decentralized VPN. Some DVPNs like the Deeper Network also take consideration of these issues and try to provide solutions to address them but that will be another day's topic. So what about Tor? Tor stands for the Onion Router. It is an open source product known to be used to access the dark web or the deep web. And what's on the dark web or the deep web? Well, I'll let you do that part of the research yourself. Some of these VPNs or DVPNs claim to be more secure than Tor or faster than Tor. Well, they probably got it right with the speed part, but more secure? I'm not too sure about that. It really depends on who you're trying to protect your data from. Due to the complexity of Tor, I will explain it with a whiteboard session. So technically Tor is not a VPN, it's a proxy. It is somewhat similar to a decentralized VPN. Let's say you want to visit YouTube. You're using three decentralized nodes to pass on your information to visit a website. But it's really unnecessary for a public service like YouTube, unless you're in an area where YouTube is blocked. Otherwise, it's kind of like, instead of buying beer, you're now just going through three people to buy a bottle of water. Why would you ever do that? In this case, there's really no need to sacrifice speed for security. So it's just like decentralized VPN, authorities can still sit at your internet provider and the destination, assuming they know both of these locations, then they can use AI machine learning to kind of figure out who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. But let's say, what if you do want to buy beer and you do know that there is a beer provider who will potentially sell beer to underage college students. So of course they want to keep themselves out of trouble, so they decide to stay in the dark. And they will say something like this. They say, hey, in order to buy beer from me, you have to contact one of these people first. So now you're like, all right, you know, you, you talk to all your buddies and all the people on the street, you finally figured out who these people are. Now, instead of using three different strangers, 
you're using two different strangers just to send your message to this third person, which is the person knows how to get the message to a beer provider. But this person doesn't exactly know where the beer provider is. He's just a messenger. He will pass a message to the next person and the next stranger and the next stranger. And finally, to the beer provider. And remember, all this message is saying that, hey, I'm trying to buy beer. Do you provide beer? And the beer provider can say, yeah, I provide beer. Or they can say, nah, I'm out of beer today or I don't want to sell beer to you. So let's say in this case, the beer provider does want to sell beer to you. Instead of going through the same network we just established to sell the beer, the beer provider says, well, the previous communication might be compromised um, and it's really only used to establish the initial communication. Let's find somewhere else to trade our beer. So the beer provider will choose a rendezvous point and this is where everything's happening. Okay, so the beer provider will create another tour network, it goes through the first person and the second person and the third person and finally goes to the rendezvous point. And now he has passed his beer over here, all right? And this is your beer. And you will go through the same two strangers, the first one, the second one, and then the second one will now go to the rendezvous point where the beer is to drop off your cash. Okay, now the exchange has happened. Your stranger right here is gonna take over the beer and pass down to the first person and then pass back to you. And on the other side, these people will pass the dollar back to the beer provider. So essentially going through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different nodes just to get your beer. And that's about as secure as it can get. And this is why it's so difficult for authorities to crack down a hidden service on the deep web. Because essentially these ten nodes can be anywhere in the world, right? Uh, you can have something in China, you can have something in Brazil, you can have something in Switzerland, you can have some Thing in Canada, you can have something in Iceland, like really, they, they can be everywhere. So first, they have to pick out these nodes out from like hundreds, thousands of other nodes in the world, okay? They, they have to figure this part out first. And then they will say, all right, we have figured out these are the nodes we want. They figure out the traffic flow and they will say, okay, which country do we have to contact? How can we make sure they collaborate to provide us the information. And let's say if you're in the US and they're running to countries like Russia, Brazil, or China, there's just no way, okay? No, no way they're going to provide the information to you. So as you can see, if you're trying to buy beer through the Tor hidden service, it really takes a lot of time, authority, and international collaborations to know you're underage drinking, all right? And in this entire process, we are using 10 nodes to achieve the maximum security and anonymity at the extreme high cost of latency and speed. And by the way, I'm not saying that everybody using VPN, DVPN, or Tor are doing illegal stuff, but it is very difficult to deny that a lot of illegal activities are actually taking advantage of these peer-to-peer -peer networks. But there are a lot of legit and cool things you can do with them, such as playing video games on a foreign server, buy airplane tickets for cheaper price from a different country, watching a home nation's TV show while you're traveling overseas. Pretty cool, right? So I hope by now you have a basic understanding of VPN, DVPN, and Tor Network. Which one's your favorite? Cast your vote under the community tab. This is Mototech. Thank you for watching. I will see you next time.